60 webinar uh, summer report back um, the people have solutions so uh, we have a little bit of music if you strain you might hear it um, but you know this is all this is all how we roll it's beautiful um, thank you all for coming in I'm going to give it a five minutes or so for folks to trickle on in uh, we had an amazing 450 people sign up um, so it's great. Um, we're going to give it a few more minutes and then we're going to start. This is the People Have the Solutions 350 report back chat and uh, report back uh, for the summer. I'm looking at the chat and um, we're just going to ask folks to put in your name, um, where you're located, and um, something just maybe a one word that describes how you're feeling today and if our chat monitors can also drop that in the chat um, that reminder that would be excellent thank you everyone look at all the places that we are calling in from um this is amazing and if anyone wants to i see kyle says feeling good so appreciate that kyle and lisa and great and i see my father-in-law checked in too that's what's up uh, <laughs> so just just a reminder that this message this uh webinar will be recorded um so just remember that thank you everyone sweet this is great to see um i'm gonna start us off um so thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is Nico Urugama. Um, I am the 350 Partnerships Coordinator here in the United States. Um, and before we begin, just, you know, if there's something around that you need, want to, like, if you like smells, um, I picked some lavender from outside the public library um, to help ground me. Um, if there's something else, maybe um, someone that, someone beautiful in your life or something beautiful that happened, just Take a second to close your eyes and think about it. Um, think about that person. Think about that event. Um, breathe in that smell. Stretch your muscles if you need to. Um, and come into this webinar with all the grounding of your ancestors, um, of the land that you're from, and the land that is um, being occupied. Um, and just uh yeah come in uh, with your full selves we appreciate everyone for taking their time whether it's nighttime the morning time uh, we have one of our amazing speakers from tanzania calling in at 1 a.m their time so so grateful um and thank you for doing that um we're super excited and honored to present this panel today the people have the solutions um, which is our summer report back from the 350 us team um, there are some 350 staff here on the call. Uh, we're not going to spotlight them, but uh, you hopefully will see them um, tonight, some of them tonight, and also throughout um, this year and in different spaces. So uh, thank you for midnight in, in Berlin. Um, so we just wanted to know that we have a really amazing staff, um, and you'll be hearing from us throughout the year. Please check your emails. Please answer your phone calls. We're happy to be in touch with you all. Um, as you know, 350.org is a global climate advocacy organization dedicated to ending our dependence on fossil fuels and ushering in a fast and just transition to, new, to renewable energy. Uh, we believe that the struggle to protect our planet and to stop the climate crisis is not separate from the struggles for racial justice the struggle for affordable housing, the struggle against militarism and imperialism, just to name a few. So we're working at the, we're trying to work at the intersections. We're trying to make these connections and this is what our panel is about today. As planet defenders, our charge is broad and so our analysis must be broad as well. Saving a forest um, cannot be isolated from the historical and current day attempts at genocide and disposition of land um, from those who stewarded and protected those lands. It cannot ignore the fact that people were, were enslaved and forced to build structures that heralded a new phase of accumulation of unprecedented wealth for a small minority. It cannot be separated from the fact that poor working class and largely black and brown communities around the world 
live every day with poor air quality. And we, our climate crises have showed that in the recent weeks, you know, it, we're not immune in the global north from things that have been happening in the global south for um, generations. As global capital starts to look towards renewable energy sources, we cannot ignore the fact that the structure of global capitalism will only continue these same patterns of exploitation, expropriation, and extraction on the backs of those already most affected. The solutions that we raise up must tackle these intersectional issues and be rooted in the communities at the front lines of the fights. Though the Canadian wildfires are the latest wake up call to the bankers and hedge funds on Wall Street, we know that in this country and around the world, they continue to ignore the demands of the people to stop burning fossil fuels. They are aided globally by governments, legislatures, and judicial systems that sustain the infrastructure of racial imperial capitalism. Um, I just want to note too that oftentimes we may feel outrage, anxiety, hopelessness, and despair when we look around. That's uh, totally, those are all totally normal feelings. And we must learn to lean on each other um, and to center our struggles around the most oppressed and organize with love and joy. Um, that's super important. We can't lose sight of that. We can't lose sight of our dignity and our humanity. Um, the people are rising and we have the solutions. Uh, it was the Italian philosopher Antonio Gramsci who wrote, the old world is dying and the new world struggles to be born. Now is the time of monsters. So we are in the time of monsters, but it, that means that we have, we have the hope that actually we can turn things around. Um, we present this panel today to you to give you an idea of what has been moving in the campaigns that you all have been supporting and uh, actively supporting and what you've been hearing from um, 350.org over the past few months. Uh, we will hear from our wonderful panelists talking about the fights to stop pipelines in the Appalachian Mountains and in East Africa. We will hear about the fight to stop the construction of a police academy in Atlanta. And we will hear about an exciting new campaign around utilities here in the United States. I'm going to pass the word over to uh, my comrade Jeff Ordauer, who is the North America Director for 350, uh, for, your, for a few words. Thanks, Thanks, Jeff. Nico. Thanks, Nico. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Um, yeah, I appreciate um, what folks are putting in the chat. We're, we're here both you know, with excitement and anticipation, and also th things are hard. Um, you know, as someone pointed out in the chat, we had the highest recorded temperatures in the recorded history on July 3rd across the globe. And we're, we're facing some, as Nico talked about, very, very significant crises. Um, and we're trying our best to figure out how we move to that moment. Um, and so the first thing I, I want to just give us a little bit of a U.S. context. I know Nico's given us global context um, for what we're doing, why folks are reporting back, and where we're moving forward with our programming. And the the great thing about seeing so many of you is I know that many of you last month, a month ago, were were in the streets, were in front of courthouses, were in front of the White House, were um, part of 68 actions that the 350 Network Council organized and many, many local groups participated in, as well as many allied organizations. Um, and those actions were part of what we're talking, calling an, an arc of escalation. And that arc of escalation um, is getting us through November in an attempt to sort of stand up to uh, the all the crises that we face. So the actions were the shot across the bow. In September, um, the Secretary General of the UN as, as folks know, has called for a climate ambition summit. And there's a climate summit happening in New York, in New York City on so, uh, September 20th, I believe is that date. But on September 17th, we'll be seeing a mass march and mobilization in New York City. We've been hearing from many local groups that folks are chartering buses and going to be there. And we know that a mobilization itself is not going to be enough. Um, so we're also Going, there's also going to be some actions um, around that, a lot of direct actions and ways for folks to participate in those, um, particularly right after this mobilization and before the summit, so that we're putting both the president um, on notice as well as folks around the world that we're not going to stand for what's happening. And the Climate Ambition Summit needs to be about 
um, working effectively around climate and climate change and eliminating fossil fuels. And then the other piece of what we're doing around the Climate Ambition Summit and around the arc of escalation is next week, um, you'll be seeing from us a pledge, a way we know that things move globally because they move locally. And so we're going to be moving local pressure. There's been an opportunity for you to engage your local elected officials in a pledge um, to participate in, to sort of push President Biden, to push global leaders around what action they're taking that's insufficient around climate. And so there's something that you can do in your cities, in your counties, in your towns to participate in that. So look for an email from us next week about the pledge for elected officials. And then we know the mobilization in New York is not enough. And as a global organization, we're going to be part of a global day of action, um, a global moment. So 350 and allies across the world in Africa and Asia and the Pacific and South America are going to be taking directly on fossil fuel companies who are making record profits. They're profiting off of the war. They're profiting off of destruction of the planet. And we're going to be holding them accountable for what they're doing, for the just obscene profits that they're making um, and making sure that that money is redistributed where it needs to go into the solutions that we need to be pushing for. So that will happen the first week in November. Stay tuned for that. Um, and we really want everyone who's interested to be able to participate. Um, and then the final piece on actions and escalation is we know none of these actions themselves are sufficient. Um, and there needs to be a lot more than what's happening. But we don't necessarily claim to have the answers. We had some suggestions. We were inspired by how many folks took action based on the Network Council's call on 68 cities. Um, but the other thing is we don't know what you're thinking, what you're thinking about. And so on over the, there's going to be a survey at the end of this. And if you sign up because you're interested in taking some kind of direct action, we're also going to be having some focus groups with 350 members, three folks who have been on this call and other places, because um, we want to hear from you. We want to hear what you're thinking about and what you think are the is the sufficient way for us to rise in terms of action to stand up to the crisis. And then the second thing I want to talk about is our role in solutions and how we're thinking about it. It's not just about the resistance, but it's about the solutions we want to build. We've talked about this in, in as we've emailed you. We've talked about local groups have talked about this. We talked about this on our last call. Um, but what we want to be doing is it's about a number of things. We saw unprecedented a year ago now, $360 billion through the Inflation Reduction Act and other money and infrastructure to help us convert. And part of our goal is to eliminate, or our job is to eliminate the barriers to a just transition off of fossil fuels. And one of the major roadblocks to that has been utility companies, all right? Utility companies are hugely problematic for a number of reasons. And we're gonna be talking about utility companies, we're gonna be hearing about the utility companies from our panelists today. The mix there, they continue to have this addiction to fossil fuels. They are making sure that if you're trying to install solar on your home, it's gonna be hard for you to put that solar and sell it back on the grid, even though because they wanna have the power, they wanna control the grid. They continue for poor and working class folks to load up on bills. You pay late, you get sacked, they threaten to cut you off, you really get cut off. So utility companies are one of the biggest problems that we face to implementing the solutions that we wanna see. And then there's a governance issue. So many of them are owned by investors, right? So the rich getting richer, they're not owned by the people. They're not thinking about what's best for us, but we're all utility customers. And so we're gonna talk about the governance of utility companies is critical as well. So we're gonna be hearing from Maine in one of the most critical campaigns around that. So we've got just incredible panelists here to tell you not just what they're doing, but how you can participate. And we're gonna hear from them right now, but thank you all and appreciate all that you're doing and all that we're gonna be doing is the summer for this hot summer. And I'll turn it back to Nico. Thank you, Jeff. Um, we're gonna start, we're gonna um, move to our speakers. I'm gonna do a quick bio of all of our speakers. Um, I will say that I wanna thank um, Natasha and Mel, um, our staff who are working diligently to get Crystal Mello, who is one of our speakers who is having difficulties connecting. 
Um, she's slated to be our first speaker, um, and we may move things around um, for her to come on. But you know, um, sometimes internet in the Appalachian Mountains is is not the easiest. So, um, but I'm going to read our speakers. We have four amazing speakers tonight. Uh, Crystal Mello is a pip pipeline resistor and impacted community member on the Mountain Valley Pipeline route. She is a community organizer with a grassroots group fighting the pipeline, the Power Coalition. Um, our second speaker is Richard Sencondo. Um, Richard is a climate change scientist, environmental justice and human rights activist, and currently he is advocating against injustice on the East African crude oil pipeline, or ECOP, to voiceless rural communities in Tanzania. Thank you, Richard. Third, we will hear from Al. Al Cleveland is the campaign manager of the Pine Tree Power Campaign in Maine. With a decade of experience in electoral and issue campaigns, they are dedicated to building just thriving communities. Over the last four years, Al led a statewide campaign to end youth criminalization and incarceration in Maine. They've been a volunteer, fundraiser, and leader in, leader in campaigns around tenants' rights, protecting LGBTQ youth, and democracy reforms. Now they are dedicating themselves to building public power for Maine. And last but not least, we have the incredible Kiana Jones, uh, who is a political and social justice activist and community organizer, and a staunch advocate for quality, affordable childcare, and equity in education. She currently works with community movement builders, community movement builders to educate, engage, and empower the Black community in Atlanta, Georgia. She is an ordained minister and proprietor of E equals MC squared Educational Services LLC, where she works as a homeschool curriculum consultant, IEP advocate, and German translator. Kiana is the wife of Jared Moore and mother to their five unique and extraordinary children. So without further ado, let's start our panel. Um, I'm going to just check with my team here if we have Crystal. Um, it looks like we don't. So we are going to um, work to get her on the line. Um, but Richard, um, if we can um, have you speak first, um, each speaker will have 10 minutes. Um, and then after that, we're going to have a kind of a question and answer with all the speakers um, when we before going to close. Um, just a reminder for our speakers to speak slowly as well. Um, and a reminder for all our attendees, if you leave the Zoom, you will be provided, when you leave the Zoom, you will be provided with a survey and we ask that you follow it up. And it's been dropped in the chat as well um, multiple times. So thank you to our folks doing that. Um, so Richard, uh, we'd love to for you to come off, come on video um, and tell us about the East African crude oil pipeline. When you're ready to begin, we'll give you 10 minutes. Okay, hello. Yeah, yeah. Good, good afternoon uh, to our team who are in UC. But uh, for those ones who are in East Africa, it is now midnight, so still good evening. So my name is uh, Richard Isenkondo. I'm based in Tanzania, East Africa. And as I said, the era is introduced by Nico. I am a climate change scientist, but also a climate activist, a environmental also justice and a human rights defender based here in Tanzania. Uh, since 2009, I decided to join the movement on the stop a campaign of a East Africa crude oil pipeline, which is known as ECOPO. The pipeline is actually transversing from Hoima and Trenga in Uganda to Tanzania. The pipeline travels about 1,400, more than 1,400 kilometers from Uganda to the East Coast part of Tanzania called the Chongoleani Tanga. So, I have just joined the movement, as I said, early to advocate about the injustice that are committed by ECOPO on the rural communities of Tanzania, particularly to the voiceless communities who majority are illiterate, who doesn't know to read and write. 
So there have been a lot of human rights violations, and particularly on the contracts where the contracts actually have been written in English. And as you can understand here in Tanzania, English is just a second language. The first language is Swahili. So these contracts were never brought to this project affected person. We call them PAPs. They are not given adequate enough time to review them. They are forced to sign. And at the end, so we realize there is about the injustices such as violations or brand acquisition acts on compensations and so on. So I will be taking directly to the community actually we are working, what actually they are against. We are working with the voiceless communities, as I said, in rural, in rural areas of Tanzania, where the, the project cuts across. Here in Tanzania, about 80% 80 of the total area of ECOPO, Tanzania is affected more than 80% compared to Uganda. In Uganda, only 20% has been affected. So much of the area affected is here in Tanzania, and the majority of the population affected here in Tanzania. So uh, the communities actually are working, they are typically against the, the ECOPO, uh, the pipeline, uh, typically based on, on violations of basic slides, particularly uh, property rights uh, that were confiscated by the projects and in relation to unfair compensations is that, uh, that we, are, uh, we are provided. So uh, the movement globally, how has been responding is that uh, uh, our organization, the Organization for Community Engagement, uh, since 2000 and 2021, uh, we decided to work at the front line with the grassroots community, particularly to enlighten them about their rights and uh, to enlighten them about the consequences of, 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 of the project on ECO. Because the project implementers and the government of Tanzania, what has been telling these people is all about the positive, positive benefits of the, of, the, of the project, such as the uh, improvement of economic, uh, economic incentives, the improvement of well-being the, uh, at the national level and at the individual level. Uh, uh, but also assurance of employment opportunities uh, to local communities uh, in all areas affected by the by the pipeline. But in actual sense, when you realize the uh, laws economic benefits, uh, they have no any sustainability uh, because they, these are just you know, we call them white collar jobs. They are uh, cheap laborers. Uh, but also we realize that even in those community. Uh, few of them managed to secure those, uh, those cheap laborers. So majority of affected communities have been lamenting about the, uh, not realizing or, or not getting those economic benefits that we are promised. But also, we are much more concerned about uh, impacts and consequences on the ecosystems, uh, key ecosystem, key sensitive ecosystems such as the uh, uh, game reserves where in Tanzania about uh, two, about three, three, three the big game reserves have been affected, but also uh, the likelihood of oil spills uh, into the ocean, the Indian Ocean, uh, the coastal and the Indian Ocean, because Tanzania is well known to be active into seismic activities. Uh, here in Tanzania, two to three years, they can't pass without experiencing strong earthquake or seismic, uh, seismic activities. So uh, together, uh, both the scientists and the community will have been much more, more, more concerned about the likelihood of oil spills over into uh, marine ecosystems, uh, water aquifers, uh, but also uh, on the land, uh, the likelihood of spill also because of the uh, earthquakes related activities. So uh, how we have been responding that uh, right now, uh, we are enlightening the communities uh, for them to get understanding the consequences on their livelihoods, the consequences on the ecosystem. And I can say that uh, in the past, since 2018, Tanzania was actually a bit back uh, compared to Uganda. Uh, it was because of the authoritarian uh, more of dictatorship political regime that we had under President Magufuli. Uh, where other activities and the human rights defenders, we were going missing. Uh, some of our colleagues, 
uh, were killed, some went missing, some were detained without even being granted a bail. So it was really, really a little bit very, very tense to operate over here in Tanzania. Uh, even some of our friends uh, decided to, to cross the border to go to neighboring countries uh, to, to continue with the, with the activism activities. But uh, President Magufuli died uh, back on uh, in 2001. Uh, it was after he won the second, uh, the second lane uh, of the general political election. So it was now the time we decided, no, 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 we can't be back. We needed to go uh, and push. So right now it is time we have become very, very, very active. Uh, however, uh, repressions haven't typically gone. Uh, we are still experiencing. Uh, I can even just remember in February, uh, I, uh, Richard Sekondo from OCE, and the Barak Alenga, a green face representative here in Tanzania, uh, we are forced to, to free the country and move temporarily to Kenya uh, to hide ourselves because uh, we had recently conducted a workshop in lighting project affected persons about the climate change and the consequences of the, of the pipeline. And then uh, after three days, so we got an alert from one of our friends in the political, in police forces. Uh, they told us to take immediate actions because uh, we are going to be detained. So we decided to call the border and we moved temporarily to Kenya and we got an uh, uh, it, 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 we, we were hosted, temporarily hosted by our colleague who works with, we don't have time uh, in Kenya. So we stayed about for three, three weeks here and later on we returned to Tanzania to proceed. But even when we returned to Tanzania, it was not safe. Uh, Balaka Lengas, a green face representative, personal computer PC and the phone was taken. And uh, also myself, uh, I lost the phone because uh, I had my, my uh, I hid my, my laptop to one of my friends. So when they came to my home, uh, my laptop was not seen that they, they only managed to get a phone uh, and uh, some of the documents uh, that were related to, to ECO to the ECO report. So uh, that are the issues right now in Tanzania we are still, we are still experiencing uh, about repression for uh, since, uh, say insecurity challenges. Uh, on, uh, on carrying on uh, our, our campaign. So we have also part of the alternatives that we have managed to do uh, is just to continue with the identification of serious observers among the project affected person, those pubs whom we are working. As I said earlier, about 80% uh, of the total area affected by uh, ECOPO in both Uganda and Tanzania is in Tanzania. So we have uh, more than 234 wards in Tanzania and eight regions that have been affected by ECOP. So right now we have only made it to, to identify serious 18 observers whom we are working. Uh, these observers help us to update, they keep us updated on whatever, uh, on whatever measures or actions that are taken by Tukar uh, uh, and the government of Tanzania. Uh, whom we, we generally refer them as ECOPO. So they keep us updated. So we consider them as not yet enough uh, because of the large area that has been affected. So we are still pushing on and looking for more partnership to, to, uh, from, from other organizations, international organizations to increase the number of observers uh, who can be speaking also with the journalists, but also who can be updating us. Uh, to make it until at least 60, because 18 of them are not enough. Uh, you see, they are they are constantly they are constantly threatened by security forces uh, whenever they want to talk uh, to us activists, uh, whenever they they, they 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 want to lie against the injustice, any kind of justice such as the unfair compensations. They are typically and always threatened. So uh, some of them, they become very weak whenever they are set trendy, whenever they are defending, uh, they even fear to, to continue uh, we, we, to continue uh, to continue with the support to the movement. So we consider Richard, them as it. Yes. Richard, yeah, thank you so much. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna have to cut it for now, but we're gonna come back to um, you at the end um, when all of our speakers go. Um, but this is very helpful to get us a give give us a clear picture of how um, Total 
energies um, is um, trying to build a pipeline in Tanzania and Uganda and all the displacement and you're talking about the repression that's happening um, against you against the project affected persons um, and how um, and, and against the ecosystem there as well so I want to let's give Richard some love in the chat you're seeing all the reactions come up Richard um, we're going to come back to you at the end it sounds like we have Crystal Mello on. Um, so I'm going to ask Crystal to please turn on your video. Uh, we're so excited to have you. Um, and you're going to have 10 minutes. Um, there we go. Yay, Crystal. So you're going to have 10 minutes um, to give us a little update um, from the Mountain Valley Pipeline. And don't forget to unmute. Okay, are we good? <laughs> You're great. Okay, thanks y'all so much for putting this together and dealing uh, with my trials with the internet and um, getting lost out there in the internet world. Um, thank you for putting this together and linking us all um, because I, I know that's what's important, all of us hearing each other's stories, learning about each other's fights, growing together as we have in the past couple of years. It's, it's been an amazing thing to be a part of. Um, I am a mom that lives here in Eastern Montgomery County, also um, on stolen Monacan and Tudelo land. Um, I'm the mom of a 31-year-old daughter and a 16-year-old son. I have two grand babies, one 12 year old and one one year old. Uh, I have lived in Virginia mostly all my life, uh, over 20 years here at this present address, which is in Eastern Montgomery County. Um, and I clean houses for a living. I've been doing that for over 25 years. Uh, the fight against the Mountain Valley Pipeline started in 2014. Uh, I personally didn't get involved in 2018. Uh, my son and I noticed a path of trees cut down leading to the Roanoke River in our town. I had heard of the pipeline and read about direct actions being taken against it, um, but I didn't realize it was coming to our town. Uh, some folks in Bent Mountain took to the trees on their own property. There's been multiple uh, blockades, and that's what really got my attention was seeing that more in the news than just the talk about the pipeline. Um, so uh, not really sure how I missed the, the local memo about it. A friend says they don't really have a ribbon cutting ceremony to let everybody know like this is gonna happen and, and design like that, right? So we, we don't fight against them. Um, and uh, so yeah, just being busy as, a, as an everyday mom, you know, trying to maintain the home front, uh, not, not hearing about that was was sad. Uh, the MVP is a 42 inch underground pipe that will carry frack gas from Mobley, West Virginia to Pennsylvania County uh, in Virginia. 42 inches is huge, y'all. Um, have you ever hula hooped? If you think about back in the day doing the hula hoop, it's bigger mm. than that. Um, so if you think about that, you know, going around your hip, like that's what they want to put up and down these these mountains and through these these waters. It's um, you can sit in this pipe. We have had we have some of the steepest mountains in our region. Uh, they will disturb over a thousand water bodies, which include rivers, streams, creeks, wetlands, many unnamed water tributaries. Also, we have a unique landscape here. Karst topography refers to natural landscape that is largely the result of chemical weathering by water resulting in caves, sinkholes, cliffs, and steep sided hills called towers. These features Crystal. form when water picks up carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and Crystal. ground to form Crystal. carbonate. Can you just slow down just a little bit for our interpreters? Yes. It's, you're doing great. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm all a mess now with the whole uh get on and i'm like uh um so cars so i'll go back to cars because it's so important a lot of people don't understand cars but uh that's a lot of our topography on this 
pipeline route. It refers to natural landscape that is largely the result of chemical weathering by water resulting in caves, sinkholes, cliffs, and steep-sided hills called towers. These features form when water picks up carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and ground to forward to form carbonic acid. We have many, many caves along the path of the Mountain Valley Pipeline, which makes this project so much more a risk for failure. And I'm still not convinced that it can even be built on this terrain, but it won't stop them from tearing everything up, uh, trying to do that. Uh, so over the last multiple years, um, I, so Wall Street, the banks, uh, the corporate partners behind the project who want the quickest way to get their gas to markets. Uh, since this has been approved through the Biden administration, it, it literally got is a, a, a pass from Congress. Um, they have free range to do whatever they want now. It was attached recently to the national debt ceiling. Um, that's sad that a, a, a private company can have that much power. Uh, to do this. Um, over the years, we've monitored, they worked actively in 2018, and we, the people, taking pictures and getting out there monitoring uh, the destruction that they were doing and reporting that resulted in over 300 violations. They've been in so much trouble. The only way that they could get this done is to get it through Congress. And um, it'd be interesting in, to find out how that happened. There, in my opinion, lots of people got paid off. You know, I hate to say that and only have a little bit of proof, but uh, Joe Manchin is uh, getting a lot of kickbacks from this. And so is Schumer. Um, um, there's not, there's very few access points along this route to local service, home heating, so this is for a, a bigger, a, a greedy group of people uh, in our area. Rono Gas is one of the investors and they have about a 1% uh, interest in this. And I do believe that's what made them eminent domain. Uh, Rono Gas does have the makings of a gate station in my community where they can tap into this. And uh, the board to ask if they this could be tabled, you know, because there were so many uh, things going forward that didn't look good for the pipeline, and just ask them if they could table it. Rono Gas gave the excuse that uh, they needed this, uh, the equipment, something like within six months, they needed to use it, um, and that this would keep the prices down to their customers. And like maybe two weeks later, there was an article in the Rono Times where Rono Gas was trying to go for a price increase of 11%. So they're also putting this burden on their customers to cover their awful investment in this project. So people in Roanoke who um, are already uh, struggling um, now uh, that Roanoke's actively being gentrified. Um, they're, they're paying the price and, and the rent prices in Roanoke have, have gone up a lot. So people are already struggling in Roanoke and now they're paying for the Mountain Valley Pipeline also. Um, uh, groups have been putting their bodies in the way. I talked a little bit about that earlier. Um, rallying at banks, third act uh, is wonderful at going to banks and, and um, setting up 24 hour vigils in front of the banks, you know, reaching, talking to people, letting them know what these dirty banks are doing and the money that they're invest, they're putting in the bank is what, what harm it's investing to so many people. Um, teaching, having water monitoring classes, uh, uh, construction sites, uh, learning how to get a time stamped app on your phone so you can take these pictures because if they're not time stamped, then they don't count. Uh, lobbying, art builds, beautiful music, meals. Um, those are ways that we're all fighting this pipeline. Um, some alternatives, Solar is seems to, but that was even tabled uh, in Virginia recently, so that can't even be a thing 
for at least the next year, uh, you know. Uh, thank, thank you, Crystal. Thank okay. you so much. Yeah, this is great. I love your passion. And it's, it's great to hear about what the Mountain Valley Pipeline is and how it's been affecting your communities in the Appalachia um, and how you all are resisting as moms and, and people, um, you know, just to not become another sacrifice zone. And I think, you know, that's a, an interesting, um, uh, what, what going back to Richard as well, you know, trying to stop these sacrifice zones. Um, but we will come back to you again. Um, I wanted to give a quick um, space to Tanner from Appalachians Against Pipelines quick space to talk about, um, you know, um, Crystal was talking about a little bit about the actions that folks are taking, and there is uh, an, a, a way to be involved, and Natasha has dropped it in the chat. Um, Tanner, can you come off mute and put on your video and just let us know real quick what this is about? Hi, um, can folks hear me? Okay, great. Um, well, thanks for letting me on. And I really appreciate uh, the opportunity. Um, I think just like Crystal was talking about um, with the blockades, um, Appalachians Against Pipelines has been fighting this pipeline since 2018, back when two tree sits went up on Peter's Mountain. Um, and since then, there have been many actions, many tree sits, um, which is like tapping into this long history of resistance in Appalachia to extractive industry. Um, we would love to have folks come and get involved. Um, I think Natasha dropped the link in the chat. You can fill out our intake form and we'd be really excited to have folks get involved in, there's like a whole range of actions from like Crystal was talking about, about banks to get like doing blockades on the easement and like painting banners. And there's like so many activities and things to do here. Um, there's like resistance in this area. And so we would love to be of it. Thank you, Nico. Thank you, Tanner. Yes, it's so good to see comrades from all over the place joining us. Um, so great to great to have that. Thank you, Tanner, for that. Um, and thanks, thanks again, um, Crystal. You see all the love in the chat for you. Let's give it up again for Crystal. Um, and now we're going to pass it on. Um, and I'm going to just remind um, speakers, uh, I'm going to I'm going to send you like a, a private message when you have like two minutes. Um, so I, I apologize to having to interrupt at the end like that. Um, we're going to have Al come on now to speak about the utilities campaign happening in Maine that Jeff talked a little bit about earlier. So thank you so much, Al. Thank you so much, Nico and the 350 team and all of these incredible panelists. My name is Al Cleveland. I am currently on the unceded occupied land of the Abenaki people, commonly known as Portland, Maine. And I'm really excited to talk to you all about our work here and our fight to transform Maine's energy landscape with a real way to build public power here in our state. In Maine, over the last two decades, our two investor and in utilities were bought and swallowed up by enormous energy monopolies who have turned our electric grid into a means of relentlessly increasing corporate profit. Instead of providing us reliable, affordable power and partnering with us in a renewable energy transition, we have been subject to countless outages, unaccountable billing practices, constant rate increases, and paid lobbyists who have opposed any meaningful change that we've tried to do for climate change on the state level all to increase their shareholder returns. It's clear that our work to pave the way to 100% renewable energy is necessary for our collective survival and well-being. And the obstacle in that path is even clearer. It's the investor-owned utilities. They have stood in our way at every turn of creating an energy future that responds to our planet's needs and our own. Maine's utility monopolies, central Maine power, and Versant power, are following the path of many corrupt corporations before them. They're valuing people over profit, profit over our planet. Instead of working for us, they keep raising our bills, standing in our way, and they're taking hundreds of millions of dollars in profit for their shareholders. This November, Mainers have the chance to change course and create our own power company that would be owned by ratepayers, consumers in Maine. We're going to be voting on a ballot referendum question to build the Pine Tree Power Company. It would be a nonprofit 
publicly owned power company that would have an elected board of directors. We are literally would be putting power back in the hands of made people where we could invest ratepayer funds, the money people spend on their bill, electric bills into building a grid that actually works for us, that's affordable and helps us get to our renewable energy goals. For too long, Maine has been held hostage, just like the rest of the country, by investor and utilities. They have zero incentive to build a power company that works for people. And they have every incentive to build a power company that can extract money from people that can't afford their bills. In April, 93,000 disconnection notices were sent to Mainers who couldn't afford to pay their power bill over the winter. For perspective, that's 10% of the people who are utility customers in our state. 10% of our state got disconnection notices. Our opposition likes to remind people that they don't control the supply costs of electricity. We would be buying out the infrastructure for delivery and transmission. We know that's true. And we also know from our coalition of solar developers that central main power and versant power have illegally halted renewable energy projects over the last decade. And it's only been escalating the last few years. Versant power, the utility that serves Eastern and Northern Maine has the worst solar interconnection rates in the country. They have a lot to gain by continuing to operate and extract from our, utility, our electric grid. And that's why the opposition to our ballot initiative campaign is 100% funded by the parent companies of the utilities. So far, they've spent well over $18 million to defeat our campaign. It's gonna be a lot more we're gonna find out in the next two weeks. It's expect, this is expected to be one of the most expensive ballot initiative campaigns in Maine's history. They're feeding the public misinformation and lies about how your utility bill operates, which is even just more hurting our communities. And they're also consistently asking for rate increases. Six days ago, they both were approved and given a 20% rate increase. After three years of Mainers having unprecedented increased bills with supply costs. In Maine right now, we also have one of the most unreliable grids in the country. And it's not just because we live in a cold, wintry environment. We have some of the worst power, out power outages, leaving vulnerable people without power for way too long. It takes longer for when your power gets turned off in Maine to come back on than anywhere else in the country. And our largest utility, Central Maine Power, continues to be ranked dead last in the nation for customer satisfaction over the last four years. So the conditions are really ripe for change. Our grid has been underinvested in because the utilities don't see a profit with mass investment over small changes. And this is a huge problem if we want to meet any of our climate goals here in Maine. We have a democratic controlled governor and legislature, and yet we cannot move anything through our state because of the utility lobbying. Right now in Maine, we know that transportation is about 50% of our carbon emissions and we heat with some of the highest rates of heating oil in the country. If we are going to accomplish our goal of electrifying everything, we need a grid that is reliable and affordable or else there's no way we can convince our communities to get electric transportation or electric heating. We know that the first six communities in the U.S. to get to 100% renewable energy were all consumer-owned utilities. And that's why in 2019, our coalition of young people, energy experts, small businesses started working to figure out how we build a consumer-owned utility for our state. And in 2021, we passed an incredible bipartisan bill through our legislature that would about have built the Pine Tree Power Company. Of course, this was vetoed by our quote unquote progressive governor whose entire career has been lined through the pockets of the investor owned utilities. And so in 2021 and in 2022, we worked with over 300 volunteers across the state to collect 80,000 signatures to get a question on the statewide ballot that would allow Mainers to take control of our electric grid. 80,000 Mainers are using our constitutional right to decide collectively about the future of our energy and our climate and our rates. And we're rallying all over the state right now to build this campaign and our coalition 
to really talk about how if we want to get to a place where we have cheaper rates, where we can invest in the grid we need, we have to change the ownership structure of utilities. And we have to say this cannot be something that's owned by corporate shareholders in places that don't represent us. We need an elected board to be able to make these decisions. This campaign is a case study of what we can learn right now when huge multinational corporations are going to pour millions and millions of dollars to defeat us. The tactics they're using are going to be replicated. The narratives they're testing are going to be used over and over again. Maine's biggest utility, Central Maine Power, is owned by Avangrid. Um, who has been trying to purchase the New Mexico utility. Um, Rochester, New York has been trying to kick one of Avon Grid's um, companies out of their district because of the same things we're dealing with here. We have a really clear uh, enemy in this campaign. It's the investors. They're raising our rates. They're using our money to interfere in this election. They're using our rates to tell us how to vote. This is really helpful because if we have a chance to win in November, we can bring public power, not just to Maine, but utility accountability nationwide and examples to all of the incredible organizers of how you fight such big money. For us to win, we need a lot of support. And that's why we are asking for volunteers, supporters, donors all across the country, because we know we're not gonna be able to fight a huge multinational corporation by ourselves. We are an incredible scrappy grassroots group of young people here and we need all of the help we can get and so i know our website will go in the chat and i really um just ask if you all have ideas excitement energy please try to get involved with us thank you so much al and great timing um thank you for giving us a little bit of a um, intro into what the multinational utility companies and uh, are doing um to um, to consumers. Um, it's the three three of you, you, Richard, and Crystal have kind of painted a really interesting picture of, um, on one hand, also painting this picture of like corporations who kind of do have all the money and are, uh, you know, um, mo moving democracy in their way to their, um, to their interests, to serve their interests um, over the objections of the people and over the needs of the people. So I uh, want to really appreciate um, you talking about this exciting campaign, and we're really excited to continue supporting. Um, and so now with that, we're going to pass on to Kiana to tell us a little bit about the campaign to stop Cop City down in Georgia. So Kiana, you have 10 minutes. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nico. And thank you to 350. Thank you to these amazing panelists who are giving us an update on just some of the things that we have been fighting here in the US. Um, we are really in a global climate crisis. Not that we are just now getting here. We have been here for quite some time, but I do believe that we are at a point right now where things are truly critical. Again, my name is Reverend Kiana Jones. I bring you greetings from occupied Muscogee Creek land here in Decatur, Georgia, where we are right adjacent to the city of Atlanta, Georgia. And as Nico has mentioned, I am involved in the movement to stop Cop City. I am a grassroots organizer who has been doing the work of organizing for more than 15 years now. I started organizing in New Jersey many, many years ago. And I started out as an advocate for quality education in my community of Roselle where I live, that grew into advocating for everything that affected our community, but particularly for quality education and for the rights of students with special needs. So I am an IEP advocate. I do still advocate for parents who have children to get their IEPs, but more recently and most recently, I have been heavily involved in the movement to stop Cop City. Coming back to Georgia in 2020, I jumped in feet first into social justice organizing here. We all know what was going on in 2020. And in 2020, the city of Atlanta saw the uprisings of people in a way that it had never quite seen since the civil rights movement. 
And as a result of that, people in a very ritzy area of the city of Atlanta called Buckhead began to get nervous. The establishment, the capitalist establishment and powers that be in government in Atlanta began to get nervous. And what they were nervous about was the power of the people. They saw that if people mobilize and organize and work together in community, that there is nothing that we can't do. So a council person at the time who was the representative for District 12, her name was Joyce Shepard, came up with the idea that Atlanta needed to build Cop City. What Cop City would be is not only a grand symbol of state repression, but Cop City would be the answer to the uprisings of the people in the city of Atlanta and quite frankly, in the state of Georgia because Cop City would not only be a place where officers in the city of Atlanta would be trained in military techniques and tactics, they would actually be training officers from all over the state and the nation. And in fact, because of an agreement that we have with the Israeli Defense Force through the Georgia International Law Enforcement Exchange, there would be military uh, personnel from all over the world who would come and train here in the city of Atlanta at Cop City. And the reason that it's called Cop City is that this so-called training facility would be equipped with a mock city to practice quote unquote urban warfare that language is taken directly from the initial proposal for Cop City, taken directly from the contract and description of what it is. Urban warfare is what would be practiced and trained for at the site that they are looking to build Cop City on. It would also have a burn tower. The initial iteration included a Black Hawk helicopter landing pad for Black Hawk helicopters. And there is an existing firing range on the property, but with the new plans, they will upgrade that firing range and also build a SWAT facility right across the street. Now, the very striking thing about this particular facility is that in order to make it happen, the city of Atlanta has commandeered 381 acres of forest land in unincorporated DeKalb County, wherein they don't even have jurisdiction. That 381 acre acres of forest land is known as the Wilani Forest. It has since been renamed the South River Forest and is the largest urban forest in the Southeastern United States. It is also known as one of the four lungs of Atlanta. It encompasses the South River and the South River watershed. The South River is the headwater of the largest river system in the state of Georgia, the Altamaha River. It is also the second most polluted river in the United States. And while we are talking about the area where they are trying to build Cop City, unincorporated DeKalb County, that portion sits in Southeast Atlanta. However, because that portion of land is in unincorporated DeKalb County, those residents who live there have no power to vote for the mayor of the city of Atlanta or any of the council people who represent the city of Atlanta. So you see the conundrum here. But uniquely, that is also the area that I was born in. I was born and raised there. My 90-year-old granny still lives there. I have friends and other relatives who still live there in that area. And we know that that area of Southeast Atlanta has been neglected for decades. I mean, I remember when I was a child, there were landfills there when I grew up. I mean, right now there is still pollution in the water from lead, from bullets, from the firing range, still running into the water. So what the city of Atlanta had, has decided to do is partner with the Atlanta Police Foundation to try and build this facility. And the Atlanta Police Foundation is comprised of major corporations like Home Depot, Delta, Chick-fil-A, Coca-Cola, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, J.P. Morgan Chase, Georgia, Georgia Pacific, Cox Enterprises, Waffle House, just to name a few. And what we've also seen is that those very same corporations are the corporations that sponsored SB202 in Georgia 
a few years ago, which is an omnibus voter suppression bill. What that means for the people of the city of Atlanta and the state of Georgia is that in addition to already experiencing widespread state repression, we would experience more. And we have already seen the evidence of that because the establishment here is dead set on building this project right where they are trying to build it. They do not respond to people who ask them to take it to another location. They do not respond to the prospects of envisioning using City of Atlanta property to build this facility on. I suspect that it has something to do with the fact, aside from the people of DeKalb County not being able to vote for those officials who are making these decisions, but I do suspect that it might have something to do with what we call new market tax credits. And if anyone knows what new market tax credits are, I do believe that the city of Atlanta is using these to give money to the Atlanta Police Foundation in exchange for kickbacks from the Police Foundation to make sure that Black neighborhoods will be repressed with police presence, I mean, heavily repressed. Some of the repression that we have seen right now in the state of Georgia as a result of our campaigning against this project is domestic terrorism charges being filed against people. And people are being charged with domestic terrorism for something as simple as attending a music festival and wearing dark clothing, holding a sign that says, Stop Cop City. Um, Many of the actions that we have stood up so far are simply protests, rallies, showing up in public forums for public comment to make sure that our voices are heard. The people of the city of Atlanta have given 17 hours of public comment at one time against this project. We've given more than 14 hours of public comment in person against this project. You see people all over the country, all over the world, standing in solidarity with this project, yet Mayor Andre Dickens and the city council of the city of Atlanta are intent on pushing it forward. There are many movements, especially those that stand in solidarity with Palestine that have come to aid us in the movement to stop Cop City. We see economic justice movements like PSL and um, Democratic Socialists that are moving in tandem and in conjunction with our movement. 350 has come to our aid in a big way because this is an issue of environmental justice. It's an is issue of economic justice. It's an issue of reproductive justice. And it is an issue of racial and social justice because we know that here in the state of Georgia and honestly all over this country, it's black people and black communities, just like the one where they're trying to build this facility that are most harmed by law enforcement and public policy here in the United States. So the things that we are doing include continued direct action. We've launched a referendum campaign, just like Al and her group have done. If you go to copcityvote.com, you can learn more about exactly what you can do to help us in this fight. Thank you so much, Kiana. Um, and also hope you're seeing all the love in the chat come in and feel all the reactions, a big appreciations to you. And I think you're really helping us tie in um, the notion about how um, the, the repression that we're seeing against black and brown folks historically, how that is gonna be used and how that may be used against environmental defenders um, going forward. So this is a very, very important intervention. Thank you. Um, now I'd just like to ask all of our speakers to um, turn on their video and um, join us for a little question and answer. Um, Want to give some time for you all to be with each other as well and maybe ask some follow-up questions. So um, Richard, let's see if we can spotlight Richard and Al and Kiana and Crystal again. Uh, and just join us in here. And um, just everyone give, please give some like warm love again in the chat for our amazing speakers. Yes, thank you. Um, I kind of wanted to first start with, um, what oh, Kian, you, you there? We didn't get you on spot, there we go. Um, so just, yeah, just once again, sort of appreciation so much for all of you, <clears throat> beautiful words. Um, thank you for your energy and the hope that you're giving us. Um, and Kian, I kind of wanted to like, actually start off with you um, just following up on that issue of like repression. I think all of our speakers um, are, you know, seeing this in some format. Um, and, 
you know, the, the, the folks in Atlanta and, um, and black and brown communities in general have been at kind of the, um, been the, the testing grounds. You also mentioned Palestine, right? Um, and they you know, these communities have been at the testing grounds of like repression and increased militarization of the police. I'm wondering if you could kind of like just talk to just like, you know, how a little bit more expound a little bit more on, on this repression and how, you know, this is going to be touching all these other campaigns and other things that we're, that we're working on, um, that is, you know, it's not just about police repression, but environmental as well. Absolutely. So when we talk about repression, there are so many avenues that the government uses to repress the voice of people. The main thing that is being used here in the city of Atlanta are the domestic terrorism charges that Mayor Andre Dickens, Governor Brian Kemp, and Attorney General Chris Carr have hoped would deter people from participating in the movement against Cop City. However, ever since the murder of our fallen comrade, Manuel Esteban Baez Teran, who is known as Tortuguita, this movement has continued to grow. And despite that repression, people still show up, but they do have the understanding that this repression has only reared its head at the inception of this movement because this movement has brought together so many people. The intersectionality of this movement is what is really scaring the powers that be. Because you have people who are just straight environmental activists who have now come together with social justice advocates who now understand the harm that police do in society. Then you have people who have been strictly reproductive justice advocates. All they care about is repro and making sure that we can have what we need reproductively. However, they see how Cop City would impact reproductive justice. They see that the basic tenet of reproductive justice that says that I have the right to raise the children that I choose to have in an environmentally safe environment free of state sanctioned and interpersonal violence would be directly impacted by Cop City. We see where transgender rights are impacted by Cop City because when you think about being charged with domestic terrorism, which allows the state to hold you for up to 90 days, even without an indictment for nothing other than the accusation and think about how transgender people are often miscategorized, mislabeled, and then they are denied critical health treatment while they are incarcerated. This movement impacts us at every corner of society and how we live, and the state is determined to repress our voices. What they've done is actually awaken a sleeping giant because they had no idea how people were going to show up. When you talk about people's First Amendment right, to simply raise their voices and criminalize dissent, then different people are going to show up in ways that you never thought they would. And this is what they're seeing here in Atlanta. And it's driven them to the point of desperation where they have even just decided to arrest those people who they thought were the leaders of this movement who provided funding for those who have been incarcerated through a solidarity fund, a bail fund. The same things that you saw during the civil rights movement are the very same things that you see now. And that is what we're up against when we talk about repression in this movement. Come on, Reverend, come on, Reverend, preach it. <laughs> um, Thank you. Yeah, that's and I think that brings you know the question of the intersectionality to um, of these movements. You know, gives us uh, for, gives me a lot of like hope um, about you know. And we talk we talked during the beginning about we're in the time of monsters, right? And and this is a, a there's a new world that's being that's struggling to be born, uh, and it gives us a lot of hope. And I and I wanted to actually ask Richard too, um, maybe like kind of like two questions. Um, one, if you could kind of talk about what we could, what from this United States here we could do. Um, I got a message to slow down a little bit, so I'm gonna slow down. Um, if you can just give us a um, an idea of what we can do in the United States here to support, especially those folks who are in jail um, and who are facing repression um, in Tanzania and Uganda. Um, and also a little bit of like, um, kind of what gives you hope in terms of continuing to organize um, out there, um, given given all the things you are up against. Um, so if you, if you, if you, if that question made sense to you, I'd appreciate, appreciate that. 
Yeah, okay, thanks, Nico. Uh, first of all, uh, what you actually would have to do be, is uh, we could do like a, a quick research right now to, to understand the magnitude uh, of repression over here in Tanzania to project affected persons in all eight regions. Uh, because right now is and I, I only I, I only like you know four four to four, four, four to five activists uh, who are uh, really experienced the intensive security threats uh, here in Tanzania. But we yet don't know how much uh, in all regions and in all words uh, like how many how many project affected depends on the parts uh, have been uh, are affected. So at least we could do a quick mapping uh, in all regions of Tanzania, uh, at least it was says maybe three quarter, uh, a quarter of all regions or a quarter of all words uh, that would at least uh, make, um, make a sense. Uh, but uh, also uh, on security matters concerning, maybe we could get like a, a, a quick, a, we say that a quick emergency fund uh, because right now we we operate with uh with, with no an emergency fund uh, to support uh, our friends who are sometimes uh, detained, injured, and also limited resources to pay lawyers. Uh, because whenever you consult them, they ask you for for a legal fee to pay. Uh, those uh, those those are the typical challenges right now which we are experiencing. So quickly to three uh, three things uh, right now to be done quickly maybe we could do it, a quick uh, a quick mapping to understand the magnitude uh, and how severity it is on insecurity uh, to to civil society organization to activists and the project affected persons in, in all in all regions that are affected by the project but also maybe access to emergency funds uh, to, to to support uh, activists whenever they are. Yeah, critical, critical yeah. Yes, thank you so much, Richard. Um, and and for folks, just for you to know, we will be talking a lot more about ECOP, um, the East African Crude Oil Pipeline. You'll be hearing a lot more about it um, at the end of July too. If you are in the New Jersey area, uh, stay tuned. Or if you're interested in coming to the New Jersey area, stay tuned. We're going to be um, doing an action at uh, Total's subsidiary offices um, in, in, in Linden, New Jersey. Um, so um, stay tuned for that. Um, and Richard will definitely be following um, following the case of the folks in jail and how we can support. Um, so please stay in touch with us, um, definitely. Um, Crystal, you know, like, first, like, Congratulations on on making this fight into like getting into like national headlines in the in the debt deal. You know, so that means something, right? Um, you know, one one question is also just kind of like how this pipeline fight looks different from other pipeline fights, in your opinion. Um, and then also um, uh, another question came in um, from someone you know who was asking if you could speak a little bit about how um, you all have woven Appalachian culture into your um, uh, fights against the pipeline, um, if you can speak a little bit to that. And I'm not going to say it, but Denali wanted me to say that. So <laughs> he didn't ask the mom question. <laughs> so I'm like, we need more moms in the movement. We need to be making more good spaces for moms in this movement um, or it's not going to succeed. I mean, that's my, you know, main thought. Um, I think the resilience, which is also, I think me and Denali have talked about that word too, because uh, resilience for some, some of us, it's like, we have no choice but to fight, you know? So sometimes when people are like, oh, you're so resilient or thank you for hanging in there. It's like, well, really don't have a choice because folks need clean water and clean air and, you know, all that. Um, I think, yeah, that's the the Appalachian part is Appalachian folks are durable. Um, you know, they they know how to survive and um, to get up every day and keep fighting. And I think that's had to happen forever. 
And I think that's something that we do have. And a lot of us, we don't have money. So we're more resourceful and uh, know how to make little things, big things. Um, does that kind of answer that question? <laughs> yeah, I'm curious if um, if you've like, what have been like your conversations too with other pipeline fights, if you've had any, like what are you seeing? Um, you know, anything different from those other pipeline fights, how y'all are sharing information? Um. Um, I think what we're seeing that's the same with other pipeline fights is kind of the, like, them taking pictures of our faces all the time, um, you know, making sure they're getting pictures of our license plates, uh, constantly targeted by the pipeline company using their easel, evil and creative methods to try to silence us. Uh, it's, it, it's rough, you know, it's scary. And I think that's, we're getting a taste of what folks out West have had to deal with. Um, there's been charges for threats of terrorism in West Virginia. West Virginia has um, a critical infrastructure law. Uh, we don't have that in Virginia right now, but that is in, in other states also. Um, so I'm sure we're gonna learn a lot more. <laughs> I'm gonna learn a lot more going forward with, you know, uh, I, I do do jail work, jail solidarity work, bail fund. Um, so I, I'm well aware of that repression and folks who are, you know, targeted by the police and whatnot. But this is different. I, you know, uh, I love, like, I think Kiana said everything that I would re say is that there's a group of people who are now finding out things that they didn't really believe were true before or didn't want to see it. And now it is older white women and men who are getting thrown to the ground and arrested. And it's, it's, I'm sure it's been hard. And I appreciate the people that have stayed in this fight and they're like, okay, we're in, you know, um, even having a lot of jail and prison talks now, people are talking more about abolition with me. So, I mean, we're, we are building something great. It's not going to be easy. We have to keep going. Yeah, thanks, Crystal. And and it's it's really interesting to see kind of like in these uh, people, these popular fights around the world too, you know, when the people are um, saying what they want, um, you know, you're getting a lot of these criminalization as you and Kiana also mentioned and Richard talking about like, you know, criminalization of dissent right now in, in Argentina, um, where there's um, indigenous folks and 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 Argent and non-indigenous folks who are fighting against the uh, a law to criminalize protest there, right? And they're strategically located in the lithium triangle, where there'll be a lot of extraction of lithium. Um, so, you know, these these things that we're talking about are are super important to track and see, you know, and and these are some of the things we want to also be exploring more in, in future webinars. Um, Al, we just want to, we want to ask you a quick question too, like, um, we're excited to be like, uh, you know, that y'all are launching this campaign and y'all are in the thick of it. Um, what can folks, you know, outside, um, outside of Maine do, um, can, can non-Maine folks be speaking to folks in Maine about this issue? How could we help? Yeah, thank you so much, Nico. And thank you to the 350 US team for supporting and endorsing this campaign. It's going to be critical to how we win. We have um, an elect in this election every way to beat the utility companies. Like we come out winning and all of our polling over and over again, but the utilities are going to pour millions and millions of dollars of lying to the public. One of the, the biggest messages that they've been putting out the last three weeks is that the Pine Tree Power Company would be harmful for our work for climate change, that they're basically gonna sue us for 10, 20 years, and we're gonna get stuck in litigation and that we actually need the investors to, for any solution. And so for folks that are thinking about how to engage, like we need your help calling main folks to set the truth, right? We need people texting folks to remind them to get out the vote because it's an off year election. So this is gonna be all about how we can turn people out. 
um, the Pine Tree Power Company here, Pine Tree Power Campaign in Maine, and then the 350 team is going to be having field programs, canvases for folks that are local, but phone and text banks virtually for folks who aren't. And we really would love any support. Um, you can check out our website for how to get involved and we're really looking forward to helping getting to connect with you all on this campaign season. Um, I wanted to give like a last words to everyone and everyone to get, you know, a minute or so to say a few last words. Um, and I just want to remind before we do that too, um, Al, you know, is talking about the Our Power, uh, the Pine Tree Initiative, the Our Power Maine and, um, and the work, the ways you can get involved in there. I know there's a referendum work happening in Atlanta as well um, and other ways to get plugged into Cop City. Um, you know, Crystal and Tanner, Tanner mentioned the, the um, direct action work that's going to be happening, and there's a, a, a sign-up sheet that you can fill out as well, and Richard, you know, will be uh, doing actions here in the United States to lift up the East African crude oil pipeline and make those links um, between what's happening here and what's happening outside of the empire. Um, so I just wanted to, maybe we can go... Um, We'll start in the order we we heard. Uh, we'll have Richard, then Crystal, Al, and we'll end with Kiana. If you can all just take one minute, literally, um, to some final closing words um, that you or any final thoughts. Um, so if that works, um, Richard, did you want to start us off? Hello. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, for your efforts to make your voice heard. Because when my voice is heard, you just understand the voice of voice, the voice of the voiceless you know, the local community, the perhaps the project affected in persons in rural Tanzanians have been heard over here today. So much is still we could continue to talk, but I think the time is not friend with us. There are a lot of particular violations on the land regulations. Uh, we are also considering to file a case uh, before 31st of July, uh, because like you know, the project affected persons has been have been given eviction notice uh, to vacate the lands before 31st of July uh, 2023. There are still a lot of grievances, they still have crops uh, in the field, uh, which are set to be invested uh, right in September and November. So uh, for, for communities which are actually depending on crop cultivations as a main livelihood and the main income generating activities, it is still very, 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 very less. So we are considering to file a case. Uh, we are still uh, communicating with uh, Zaki, uh, who is the Stop Ecopo Coalition Coordinator uh, East Africa to see the possibility of firing a case. Uh, but also we are considering now to have actions uh, such as uh, rallies, line campaigns, and uh, to light a first, first ever unique uh, petition signed by project affected person in the local community at the grassroots level. So I hope we shall continue to communicate, uh, we shall continue to collaborate uh, to see these things uh, are really happening and stop this, 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 this is uh, dangerous, dangerous ever to happen in project. Uh, so thank you so much. So much, Richard. Crystal, one minute closing out. Um, I would say uh, helping us, uh, you can always go to power.org, P-O-W-H-R.org or stopmvp.org for all our uh, up-to-date uh, actions. And uh, just yesterday, there was a FERC commenting party because that stuff is so hard, right? Like nobody understands how hard this is until you have to do it. And uh, Power has an amazing team of people who um, just wanna help people be able to use their voices in whatever ways that are. Uh, we are gonna have a, maybe a get together in this area in September. Um, reach out to us. You can reach out to me at crystal at power.org. Um, and for if you want to come down and see this beautiful place and what this pipe looks like and the, the sensitive areas that it's going through, um, any of that, or, you know, 
write Biden and tell him he's an idiot for, you know, he is not the climate president. This is not going to go well. And I hear there's going to be a little gathering in New York in September. So stay posted about that. Let's pack these streets and let them know this is bullshit. <laughs> We're not standing for it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Crystal. Thank you, so Al, a minute from you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you all so much. Um, it's really inspiring to hear from everyone who is campaigning and organizing against big corporate money. And I think what we're learning from all of each other is that the power and the pull and drive that we're seeing in our people is beyond anything that these corporate executives have. Um, we continue to need to get as smart as possible because it is clear that the Democratic Party and our local state officials are not going to save us. Um, it is clear that we could continue to engage in those systems over and over again. They are not gonna get us what we need, um, but we have all of these examples of people who are collectively fighting for their rights and their dignity. Um, and so wherever you are, I hope you all get involved in whatever that fight looks like. Thank you, Al. And Kiana, you wanna finish this off? With closing Absolutely. thoughts. Absolutely. Thank you again to everybody. Plus one, plus one, plus one to everything that has been said. What we have seen tonight is that the power of the people is not like anything else that the establishment has ever seen. They have no idea how to contain us. So the things that they are going to try to do is weaponize the law against us, weaponize the very freedoms that allow us to do the work that we do against us. But Al has said it best. The Democrats won't save us. Capitalism won't save us. Being a part of a corrupt establishment won't save us. Only we can save us. And it's up to us to make sure that the work keeps getting done. Well, thank you all. Let's get some uh, love and appreciations for our panelists in the chat. Um, Y'all are very much appreciated. And also some love and appreciations to our interpreters. Um, and to the 350 staff for uh, doing all the troubleshooting behind the scenes and making it happen. Jeff, Natasha, JL, Mel, um, all the folks. Um, and just wanted to make sure everyone reminds there's uh, JL just dropped it. There's a survey. Please fill it out. We're going to be hearing, we want to hear your thoughts on direct action for 350 around being part of the International Solidarity Working Group. Um, and being connected to local groups um, and being part of, you know, we want to hear your thoughts on utilities as well. So this is not going to end here. We want you to stay plugged in, um, you know, be connected. Um, you're going to hear more about these struggles. Um, and I'm, I feel like I'm, I'm on fire. I don't know about folks, but I'm ready to take it to the streets. So um, we're going to be supporting all these campaigns and continue to build and create that hope and lean on each other in love and joy. So uh, thank you all and uh, have a really great night.